again, very happy to welcome Professor Vivek Goyal of Boston University to speak in our seminar today. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley. And um, since then, I guess he's had quite an extensive career. He started at the Mathematical Sciences Research Center of Bell Labs and followed by two faculty positions and two startups, the second of which was acquired by Google. He's a fellow of both the IEEE and the OSA, the Optical Society. His recent work on computational imaging has won several IEEE awards. And today he's actually gonna talk about how statistical modeling relates to some of the technolo technological advances that he's had in computational imaging. Thank you, Ali. Um, in ordinary times, I would certainly like to visit in person, uh, but I know what, you, what you're going through in LA is terrible. This is maybe the first January that I'd rather spend in Boston than in LA. Um, in my talk, I wanna show you how to use Poisson and Poisson marked Poisson processes to model systems with single photon and single electron detection. This sort of fine grain modeling at the level of individual uh, particles is somehow not too complicated and yet also underexploited. The talk will be split between 3D imaging and microscopy, which will also be the split between photons and electrons. In the first part, I'll talk about active depth and reflectivity imaging based on single photon detection. In the second shorter part, I'll talk a bit about particle beam microscopy level, uh, modeled at the level of counting secondary electrons. In each half, half, I'll give some brief hints at some related stories that might spark later conversations, but I won't have time to go into detail on those topics. So to get us started, here's an ordinary digital photo of Marsh Plaza at Boston University. How many photons do you think were detected by the camera to produce it? Um, so what do you think? Whoops. Oh, I gave away my answer. I'm so, I, I, I gave away the answer. Sorry. Uh, I was going to ask you to actually um, fill out a poll for me on what you thought the answer would be within a couple orders of magnitude. Um, so it's a lot and I don't really know the answer. Um, I hope that you would have chosen four times 10 to the 12th. I think that maybe just based on the psychology of multiple choice exams, you would have choice, chosen four times 10 to the 12th. Um, but I have at least a plausibility argument for that choice. It's the product of the illuminance on an overcast day, the aperture area, the photons per second to produce a lumen, the exposure time, and the detection efficiency. So that gives four quadrillion photons. If the photo is four megapixels, that works out to a million photons per pixel. So this is a very different uh, number of photons per pixel than the setting I wanna concentrate on today. This is for context. We wanna talk about on the order of one photon per pixel, so six orders of magnitude less light detected. In this ordinary digital photography, the quality is determined by optical imperfections, sensor noise, and amplitude resolution of the sensor. There's no motivation to think about photons as discrete when there's so many of them. Today, we're interested in keeping track of every click of a detector that clicks for individual particles. In part one, the clicks are caused by photons in the context of active imaging with pulsed illumination, which is also known as direct time of flight LIDAR. Suppose we have a pulsed directed light source, then several properties can be inferred from the relationship between the transmitted pulse and the received pulse. The time shift is called the time of flight and it reveals distance. The baseline offset tells how much background or ambient light is present and the amplitude of the received pulse over the background gives the reflectivity. Scanning the light source over the whole scene, one patch at a time, can give you then a depth image and a reflectivity image. So that's the basic idea of LIDAR. And LIDAR has lots of applications from A to Z. One of the very hot LIDAR applications at the moment is autonomous navigation. 
And LiDAR is also embedded in Apple's iPad Pros, and they're in the current or next generation of iPhones. So I could also draw attention to augmented reality as a key application. The design space is very complicated with lots of issues that I won't get into today. I don't wanna talk about trade-offs today. Instead, I just wanna concentrate on how to make the most of whatever data is collected with an emphasis on the stochastic modeling that enables new capabilities. So let's talk about modeling and methods for LiDAR at around one photon per pixel starting by looking at what happens you know, when you're modeling at the level of individual clicks per photon. So we have a pulse light source that we're going to raster scan and the illumination of um, one small patch at a time, which we're going to index by I comma J creates our transverse spatial resolution. Though the talk is going to stay conceptual, I've listed some device specifications for the first set of experimental results that I'll show. We'll do detection with a single photon avalanche diode. And uh, to record the times of photon detections with high resolution, we use time correlated single photon counting. An unstated assumption in most work is that a histogram of detection times over many repetitions is treated as a proxy for the analog waveform that I was showing you on the earlier slides. It's in discrete time because there's some finite time resolution of the time tagging and it's noisy. But a histogram starts to seem like a silly concept with just a handful of detections. So forming images from so few detections might seem unreasonable. One of the key points from the first part of my talk is that it's not unreasonable to get by with fewer photons than are needed to form a reasonable histogram at each pixel. That might just be a small change of pers uh, perspective, but we want to think about the individual photon detections rather than properties of the histogram. Uh, and I'm going to take this to the extreme of just one photon per pixel. So let's develop a model for the detection time of the one photon that is detected at each pixel. From the quantum nature of light detection, what we're actually seeing is an inhomogeneous Poisson process. In the absence of any background ambient light, the rate function of that Poisson process is a scaled and time shifted version of the illumination waveform. It has a time shift depending on the depth Zij um, and the speed of light, and amplitude alpha ij, depending on the reflectivity. The contribution from background light and dark counts is a homogeneous Poisson process. So what we have is a merger of these Poisson processes, adding together the background and the response from the scene. Not every incident light pulse generates a photon detection. Suppose there's no detection from the first illumination repetition period, and there's no detection in the second, and suppose there's a detection in the third period. So here, I've marked that detection at a relatively likely time where the yellow flux waveform is high, so the detection is colored orange as if we knew that it's from the scene response. Another possibility is for the detection to be in the third period, but at a less likely time, meaning that it's due to background. But this function in yellow is not known. That's part of the actual problem. We're trying to determine or estimate the parameters of that yellow function from this tiny number of detected photons or this tiny number of uh, arrivals in an inhomogeneous Poisson process. We don't know whether uh, the rate function is what's shown here, or instead a shifted version of that. The time shift is one of the things that we're trying to infer from a single detection per pixel. So what is the distribution time of a single detection in this data collection scenario? From the periodic Poisson rate function lambda, we get the PDF as shown here in red. It's proportional to the flux times a decaying exponential factor. 
When the incident flux is large, the decay is faster. In contrast to what I've shown on the previous slide, there's a, there's a significant shifting of the peaks um, and other waveform distortion. We're going to put that aside for now, but it arises in the, in the second third of this talk. For now, let's just assume that lambda is small, such as, say, integrating to less than 0.05 over one period. Then we can approximate the PDF using only attenuation over the integer numbers of repetition periods. That approximation makes the PDF on each period a scalar attenuation of the flux waveform with geometric decay over the periods. With that, we end up with a beautifully simple model for the data by looking at the detection time u divided by the repetition period. The whole number and the remainder are independent in this, under this approximation. So let's dig into that a little more deeply. The whole number plus one for pixel ij, we call kij, and the remainder we call tij. Kij has a geometric distribution that encodes the reflectivity alpha ij in the sense that it has a parameter that has a one-to-one -one correspondence with um, alpha ij. Similarly, tij encodes the depth zij. Each tij has PDF equal to a normalized version of one period of the pulse plus background rate function that's been depicted in yellow on the previous slides. We can hope that we can exploit some reasonable model of nearby pixels usually having similar depths and reflectivities um, to make this enough to solve an inverse problem for the depths and reflectivities. So the negative log likelihood of Kij turns out to be convex in alpha ij and has no dependence on zij. That's very convenient. Um, nature is less kind with the tij distribution. If there were no ambient light under reasonable approximations of the laser pulse shape, like it's often approximated as having a Gaussian shape, we would have convexity of the negative log likelihood. But as it is, we do not have convexity. You know, all of the ambient light contributes to having a very far from convex negative log likelihood. So we developed an image formation method that exploits our probabilistic measurement model and makes some convenient choices um, to uh, have a low complexity algorithm. We develop a three-step procedure. First, we compute a regularized maximum likelihood estimate of alpha, exploiting the convexity and adding a convex regularizer. Then, because we don't want um, to have to deal with a non-convex uh, problem of estimating depth directly, we want to make believe that there is no contribution from the background. To be able to make believe there's no contribution from the background, we have a step of censoring or deleting the photon detections that we believe are likely to be due to ambient light. Then if we're making believe there's no ambient light to have convexity, we can solve a, a convex optimization problem to get a regularized maximum likelihood estimate of the depths. So we're exploiting tractability of convex optimizations by massaging the problem into using convex optimizations. The reflectivity part is no problem, but for the depth part, we want to do that censoring. So following the data collection protocol I described, we have one detected photon per pixel, and I'm going to show you results where about half of the detected photons are due to ambient light and dark counts. First, here's raw reflectivity information overlaid on the 3D point cloud. We rotate the model so that ah, so we rotate the model so that you can see that it's 3D, but this is just imaging from a single vantage point. Uh, so it's obviously very noisy. And you know, before our work, 
there were no particularly effective ways of interpreting data that's this um, weak uh, for this problem. The result of the first step gives significantly more accurate uh, reflectivity. This is the result of regularized maximum likelihood estimation of the reflectivity. It's rendered on top of very noisy depth information, so it only really looks strikingly denoised from the straight on front view. But in that view, you can read the text so you can see that it's greatly denoised. Now here's the result of step two. You can see that our technique doesn't do a perfect job of censoring the photon detections that are due to ambient light. And as you could have, might have guessed, most of the detections are happening um, near the depth discontinuities where it's hard to take advantage of piecewise smoothness of uh, the depth and reflectivity. But it's still a huge improvement upon what we had just at the result of step one. And at this step, uh, with we're willing to make believe there's no ambient light to convexify the problem that's solved in step three. And here's the result of that final um, regularized maximum likelihood estimation of depth. Uh, so you can see that this is remarkably accurate for only one detected photon per pixel when half of those detected photons are due to background light. It's a quality that's dependent on the scene having piecewise smooth reflectivity and depth. Um, and it's also made quite challenging by the dark color of the geeky t-shirt that the mannequin is wearing. So along these lines of observing small numbers of clicks and making reflectivity and depth estimates, um, I've gathered a few examples here where the first row shows the result from some conventional technique and the second row shows what we obtain with the same data. What I've described thus far is the first photon imaging method. This can be effective with signal to background ratio down to about one. We subsequently looked at related problems that are more challenging in a variety of ways. Using a SPAT array makes it inevitable that the time resolution will be greatly coarser. In this, it's about 400 picoseconds instead of eight picoseconds. It's not a state-of-the-art SPAT array, it's just what we had at the time. But you'll see that with about twice as much signal and the same signal to background ratio, we get reasonable results. We also looked at withstanding much more ambient light. Here, there's 25 times as much ambient light and Josh Rapp introduced several ideas to deal with that. And the fourth column shows imaging through a partially transmissive scatterer. Uh, these, are not, these are definitely not the only results of these type, just a sampling of my own results. Um, getting by with the smallest number of photons or the smallest signal to background ratio has been a fun pursuit, but it's not the only issue in direct time of flight LIDAR. So let's consider specifically an, automatic, uh, an automotive use case for LIDAR. You'd like to be able to see weakly reflective objects that are far away. But at the same time, in your field of view, there are going to be some objects that are near and highly reflective. And they may even be retro-reflective, like a road sign or road marker. So an automotive LIDAR system it is, is an example of a LIDAR system that has to handle very high dynamic range of incident photon flux. Handling strong signals well requires an understanding of dead time effects in single photon detectors. And so here's where I'm going to bring in a Markov chain element on top of the Poisson process modeling. We've already discussed incident photons as arrivals in an inhomogeneous Poisson process with rate function proportional to the incident photon flux or intensity. To add another detail to our model, we can note that a detector actually has an efficiency strictly less than one. This means that generation of photoelectrons can be modeled as the result of independent biased coin flips at each photon incidence. This is really just a thinning of the Poisson process so it's equivalent to multiplying the intensity um, by a scalar, and it's not particularly interesting. Things get more interesting when we include the dead time of the detector. For each photon detection, um, there's a after, after each photon detection, there is a dead period. 
which here is denoted by T sub D. For a SPAD detector, this is the time to quench so that sensitivity can be restored. And all detectors that are sensitive to individual photons have dead times. Here you see the photons that arrive too close together cannot be detected. And what's illustrated here is a free running mode without periodic resets. The resets are only at the end of the dead periods. A time correlated single photon counting module also has an electronics dead time, which here is denoted by T sub E. If T E exceeds T D, then it's also significant and causes missed clicks. I mentioned the electronics dead time because we have included the complexity of that in some of our modeling and experimental results. Um, but, gonna, but I'm going to ignore it here just to highlight the main concepts. So even when I ignore electronics dead time and consider only detector dead time, the effect is not obvious. So illustrated here by the red curve is Instant light described by a Gaussian pulse centered at 40 nanoseconds plus moderate background. And so this is what the response might look like um, in a LIDAR experiment when the object is 20 nanoseconds of light travel away. The reflection comes at 40 nanoseconds because the light travels there and back. Um, and there's some moderate background. What's shown in blue is the corresponding detection histogram when um, the repetition period is 100 nanoseconds and the detector has 75 nanoseconds dead time. So the relationship between that red curve and the blue histogram, it's not obvious at all. It's hard to interpret and it's not just the kind of approximately multiplication by a scalar that I was showing you before um, when the incident flux is low. Now, if I was seeing this um, histogram in blue, I guess I would assume there was an object at a distance corresponding to a little bit less than 40 nanoseconds time of flight. And I guess that would be a natural interpretation of this. Um, but this is actually the response from this extremely simple scene. Um, without a good model that explains dead time effects, how would I interpret this? I might think that there's some partially transmissive stuff out there at about 20 nanoseconds uh, worth of travel time. That's possible. You know, there could be fog between you and the object at 40 nanoseconds. Um, and the secondary peak is very broad, so it might be caused by something like fog. Um, the point is that it's hard to interpret this. Uh, to have accuracy over a, a wide range of conditions, um, we should do better at interpreting uh, detection histograms like this. So, how could we mitigate these dead time effects? I mean, so far I've just shown you that they're kind of complicated, not obvious how to interpret. Um, well, we can avoid them in at least a couple of ways. We could attenuate the flux at the detector or, uh, well, yeah, we could attenuate the flux of the detector to simply make it unlikely that a photon arrives during a dead period. Equipment manufacturers, vendors, and users often speak of obeying the 5% rule to do this. That means to design the system so that at most 5% of repetition periods have a photon detection. This 5% rule is why I used the number 0.05 earlier in the talk. There's also a special case where the repetition period and the dead time coincide, making the dead time reduce the photon count rate but not distort the histogram. There's also an approximate histogram correction method in the literature that isn't quite exact or correct. The third approach is to adjust the experimental conditions such that a synchronous model is valid. If the background is negligible or gating is used, the system can be forced to be reset by the time of the start of the next illumination period. 
Our approach is to adjust the model of the scene response to be able to obtain optimal estimates despite the various restrictions above not holding. So the simplest modeling of the effect of dead time is just a bias toward earlier detections. I showed you this in some of the early plots, even though they, they looked like they were merely qualitative plots, but they were plots that I computed to accurately show you the sort of um, shifting of the position of the peak. Now, that kind of simple bias toward earlier detections is not accurate in a free running mode. The, the difficulty in more accurate modeling is lack of independence of detections in separate repetition periods. Here that's visualized with dead periods crossing the repetition boundaries. So there's some degree of complication here from lack of independence, but the saving grace is that it's not arbitrarily complicated. Uh, we can show that a Markov model applies. To construct a discrete Markov chain model, we need to specify the state space and the transition probability matrix. The states are defined by partitioning the repetition period based on the resolution of the time tagging. A row of the transition probability matrix is the conditional distribution of the next detection time given a current detection time. So, I'm going to show you this with pictures, not filling in any numbers. I'm illustrating how to think about what one row of the, the transition probability matrix looks like when that row is the conditional distribution of the next detection time when there has been a detection at 20 nanoseconds. And this is illustrated for the dead time being 75 nanoseconds. So, if there was a detection at 20 nanoseconds, the detector is dead until time 95 nanoseconds. And at time 95 nanoseconds, the, the distribution will jump up, right? Then the, uh, and then decay from there. And it's decaying from there, you know, including a 100 nanoseconds, um, uh, a reduction model modulo 100 nanoseconds periodicity. So one row might look like this. Here's another row corresponding to a detection having occurred at 40 nanoseconds. Adding 75 and reducing modulo 100 gives 15 nanoseconds. And so that's why the um, conditional probability of a detection jumps up at 15 nanoseconds and then um, decays after that. I should say that in both of these plots, um, there's also a dependence on the position of the, um, the single reflector that's actually in the scene, right? So I'm showing you one example of how the forward model can look for a particular position of an object in the scene and a particular dead time. You know, we, we expect to know what the dead time of our detector is. We don't know what the position of that reflector is, but this is a construction of a model through which we're going to be able to estimate that dead time. Uh, sorry, estimate that position. So we can fill in the whole transition probability matrix um, P like this, and then the stationary distribution is the leading left eigenvector of the transition matrix P. So that stationary distribution can be treated as um, what the histogram of detection times ought to look like if the reflecting object is in a particular position. Right. So, so through this type of Markov chain modeling and solving for stationary distributions, we can actually determine um, essentially in parametric form all of the possible histograms for the detection times given different um, positions for a reflecting object and use that to um, estimate distances. 
Now, this kind of Markov chain modeling, it actually becomes quite tedious uh, in the case where electronics dead time is significant too. Uh, you have to go through an enumeration of cases that I don't want to include here, but that we do describe in at least one of the papers. So we experimentally demonstrated the kind of improvement that we can get from this modeling. Uh, so first, here's a ground truth proxy. So this is a 3D depth and reflectivity data set you know, that we measured uh, of our, it might be the same mannequin, but now he wears a BU hat. Um, now, if we operate at high flux naively, then there's significant bias in both depth and reflectivity. The, the reflectivity accuracy, I'm not attempting to quantify here, but I'm giving you the depth accuracy in mean absolute error. The, the like PicoQuant and other manufacturers of time correlated single photon counting modules would tell you, hey, don't use this equipment unless you obey the 5% rule. So if we use the 5% rule and avoided dead time effects, we would have the performance shown in the top row on the left, um, obviously significantly worse. And our method is not to avoid, but to make good sense of the data. You know, and that involves understanding an underlying Poisson process model, but also understanding that dead times create a lack of independence that we can model with Markov chains, um, and the results are much better. So the mean absolute error of the depth is about half, of what you get with avoidance. Um, I'm sorry, it's about half of what you get. Uh, uh, it's much, much less than half of what you get with avoidance, but um, uh, it's about two thirds of what you get with the naive method. Um, and the reflectivity estimation is improved a lot too, as you can see. Uh, so we get a visual improvement that's even greater than you might think from the um, mean absolute error of depth improvement. So now, before switching from photons to electrons, I'll hint at three related works. This is mostly so that you can search for them and read them, um, but I'm also happy to answer questions about these at the end. So the first story is uh, if the time resolution at the detector is the limiting factor, we have a method for that. It's described in an Optics Express paper from last year. The second short story, um, the basic equipment for direct time of flight LIDAR can be repurposed for non-line of sight imaging in several ways. Uh, our edge resolved transient imaging method is introduced in a Nature Communications paper a few months ago. And for the third and final short story, let's return to LIDAR reflectivity estimation. We've talked mostly about depth, but the reflectivity estimate is important too. And since it's important in the noise censoring, it's also essential in our depth estimation results. We abstracted this as estimating the parameter of a Bernoulli process. And then we mapped that back to reflectivity alpha. Estimating the parameter of a Bernoulli process is foundational in statistics. And we believe we made a novel contribution to this. A conventional system observes a fixed number of trials, which generates a binomial random variable. First photon imaging observes until the first detection or first success, which generates a geometric random variable. If we observed until the elf success for some fixed number L, we'd have a negative binomial random variable. Even in a Bernoulli process setting where the trials are independent, there's actually something that one could optimize here and it gives a sort of free lunch. Optimizing the data acquisition is equivalent to choosing a connected rooted trellis. A couple of examples are shown here. With each trial, there's a step down either left or right based on heads or tails or detection, lack of detection. To have a fixed number of trials is to stop at a fixed depth, which gives a binomial observation. 
to stop at a fixed number of successes looks like this, which gives a negative binomial observation. We showed that a simple online adaptation scheme achieves an oracle bound, and that oracle bound gives a multiplicative reduction in mean squared error that's um, a lot like a coding gain in source coding. I mean, that's kind of per particular to my background. Um, but if any of you has seen an expression uh, resembling what I have at the bottom of this slide, please let me know at the end of the talk. It's, it's an MSC improvement factor um, based compared to um, just having a fixed number of trials um, in a Bayesian setting where uh, the parameter of the Bernoulli process is this random variable P. Okay. So now I'm going to change from problems in which we have one click per photon to instead having one click per electron. This part's shorter, but it reinforces that a particle level view of what's going on in an imaging system can lead to new and valuable methods. I'll specifically describe helium ion microscopy, but all ion beam microscopy can be modeled the same way. A helium ion microscope has a helium ion source and an electron detector. An incident ion causes emissions of electrons. The detected electrons are called secondary electrons because the source beam particles are called primary particles. The imaging is achieved by raster scanning of the beam with some fixed dwell time per pixel. the detected secondary electrons map to grayscale levels. So we're making an image of the propensity of secondary electrons to be emitted. The ions that are incident on the sample cause sputtering damage. So it's important to try to keep the dose low or to have good accuracy relative to the dose. So let's turn this into a statistical model. We look at the ions as being incident as a Poisson process. Um, you can find plenty of physics papers that tell you that that's a good way to make a model. Now, each incident ion produces a burst of secondary electrons. The ion arrivals are hidden. It's the total number of secondary electrons in the dwell time that's observed. Now, because we have a Poisson process and a fixed dwell time, the number of incident ions m is a Poisson random variable with a parameter lambda. Lambda is called the dose, and we're going to assume that it's known. We model this, the number of secondary electrons per ion as also being Poisson distributed, um, each one of them having a Poisson parameter eta. So that eta is what we want to learn about the sample. That eta is the propensity to emit secondary electrons that we're trying to form an image of as we vary across the sample. Okay, so a random variable, just terminology, a random variable associated with an arrival in a Poisson process can be called a mark. So our overall model is of a Poisson marked Poisson process we're going to observe the sum of the Xi's, the total number of secondary electrons. We're gonna call that Y. And our goal is to estimate eta from Y. And I'm only gonna talk about doing this separately at each pixel. So unlike in the first third of the talk, this is not including any kind of regularization. Just wanna see this somewhat unusual observation model in action, see what we can do with it. So can we just you know, turn the crank of estimation theory um, to reach our goal of estimating eta? Well, the model we've just developed can be written with this likelihood function. Um, the, a random variable y of this form is called a Neiman type A distribution. This is not the easiest sort of likelihood to work with, um, but it is easy to show that the expected value of y 
is lambda times eta. Um, it's easier to show that if we remember where this random variable came from than if we try to use the PMF directly. Um, but since the expected value of y is lambda times eta, um, the simple estimate of y over lambda is an unbiased estimate for eta. Um, conventionally, in this form of microscopy, you're just forming an image of how y varies from pixel to pixel. And that is th this, this simple one line tells us that that's not unreasonable. Um, in microscopy, the scale is often completely arbitrary. So if you're making an image of y or you're showing me any kind of scalar multiple of y, you're making a reasonable estimate. Now, the variance of y is lambda times eta times eta plus one. So the estimate, the so for that estimate y over lambda, the mean squared error is eta times eta plus one over lambda. Um, it makes sense that it's inversely proportional to lambda. Um, you, if you increase the dose, you expect to be able to form better estimates of of eta. But remember that in the real physics of this problem, if you increase lambda too much, you actually blast away the features of the sample that you're trying to image. If the beam provided lambda ions deterministically, like not a Poisson, if you didn't have a Poisson beam, but instead exactly lambda number of incident ions, then the variance of y would be lambda times eta. So there's this extra factor of eta plus one, which is the price of having a random beam. And we'll see that we actually don't have to put up with this. We are able to almost completely compensate for this factor of eta plus one. Our key idea is to introduce time resolution. This time resolution has nothing to do with a phenomenon associated with time ordinarily. We're not measuring time of flight and we're not looking at dynamics of the sample. So it's a different use of time than earlier in this talk. Our use of time resolution is to divide the dwell time into n subacquisitions. Now, when the subacquisitions are short enough, we can say roughly that the number of incident ions is the number of subacquisitions with at least one secondary electron. This is based on assuming at most one ion per subacquisition and at least one secondary electron per incident ion. So it's not an exact statement. It's it's for intuition or for a plausibility argument. Um, but if time resolution was really telling us the number of incident ions, um, it's really removing the effect of that randomness, that nuisance of the beam actually being random um, and partially removing that. The actual theory and methods use a more precise model and aren't based on, on this approximation. The most important, um, the most important thing in, in formalizing this and analyzing it carefully is that you have to account for the probability that an incident ion results in zero detected secondary electrons. Okay, so one of the ways to understand the advantage provided by time resolved sensing is through Fisher information. We're interested in the Fisher information about parameter eta present in a measurement y. Damage to the sample is proportional to the dose lambda. So let's look at the Fisher information per ion by dividing by lambda. It turns out that low dose measurements are the most informative per ion. Also, Fisher information is additive over subacquisitions. So this variation of the normalized informativeness suggests what we should do. It suggests that we should use a very low dose because that's how you get the most information per unit of damage to the sample. And then using additivity, just have enough of those low dose subacquisitions 
to reach any desired quality level. One of the kind of fun aspects of this is that the simple expressions for the asymptotes on the graph um, lead to a simple expression for the improvement factor from this method. And you can see that that improvement factor um, is almost the same as the eta plus one um, factor of loss that we had from the randomness of the beam. So this introdu in introduction of time resolution is almost the same as having a physically impossible deterministic beam. Now let's look at some preliminary experimental results. So John Knighty of Zeiss provided us with data from an Orion nanofab helium ion microscope. We have 128 subacquisitions, each with a low dose of an eighth of an ion per pixel. That's achieved with a 0.1 picoamp beam current and 200 nanosecond dwell time. On the left is what we see from a single subacquisition. So we're not, we're, we're not suggesting that a single extremely low dose acquisition is by itself valuable, um, but that kind of very low dose subacquisition is the most informative per unit of damage to the sample. So let's take 128 of those. Now, the conventional approach to helium ion microscopy or any kind of particle beam microscopy would have just a single dwell per location. So it'd be the equivalent of just adding up 128 of these guys. And on the right is an image that's essentially the same as um, adding up 128 of the sorts of sub-acquisition images shown on the left. I mean, there's how to scale these for display is also a major consideration. Now, processing this data actually requires additional modeling that I don't want to get into here. In principle, a helium ion micro microscope could have direct electron detection, but um, nobody actually sells that kind of instrument right now. Um, Instead, the secondary electrons are accelerated toward a phosphor central scintillator plate by an electric field. The photons generated by the scintillator are amplified by a photomultiplier tube before detection. So that all adds another layer to our modeling, some significant data processing complexities, but the principle of combating the randomness of the source beam still holds. Here, the improvement in estimated mean squared error is by a factor of about four, which is more than what our idealized suggestions would, uh, um, simulations would suggest. Uh, this is a, we have a estimated mean squared error because we don't have ground truth images, um, but we have a principled way to estimate mean squared error without ground truth. And um, we're achieving a factor of four improvement in that. So now to conclude the talk, one more of these short stories, um, not enough detail uh, to, to consider it complete for sure, but maybe something else that would prompt additional discussion. So quantum electron microscopy um, is another setting in which we've studied acquisition strategies and found that a simple stopping rule can make a big difference. Suppose there's a binary valued sample that's placed in one arm of a Mach Zender interferometer. Then when the sample is absent or transparent, constructive or, uh, and destructive interference cause an electron to be detected at D1. And so these are like conditional, this is like a likelihood matrix. When the sample is opaque, there can be a detection at any of the detectors with the probabilities shown in the table. In particular, a detection at D2 is definitive information on the sample being opaque, even though the electron could not have struck the sample since it would have then not made it to D2. So that's a sort of quantum strangeness or quantum spookiness um, that makes this quantum electron microscopy. Now, 
the term interaction-free measurement comes from applying multiple stages of the sort shown at the top and approaching surety in whether the sample is opaque or transparent without any damage to the sample. What we've done is to show that an adaptive acquisition approach makes even a single stage useful. The plot here shows probability of error as a function of the mean number of electrons absorbed by the sample with and without electron free uh, interaction free measurement um, and with and without a scattering detector D3. Uh, so it's showing improvements from interaction free measurement in, um, in a relatively easy to uh, implement setting. All right, so in this talk, um, I've shown that simple particle level probabilistic models can lead to substantial improvements over conventional processing. Part of the story is that fine grained statistical modeling can make a few photons or electrons quite informative. The idea that one click at a time modeling is valuable when the signals are weak is maybe less surprising, but it's also valuable when the counts are high. So I encourage you to think about things one click at a time. Um, and there's a review article recently uh, that includes some discussion of this. Now, before inviting you to ask questions, um, I wanna let you know that I have openings for both students and postdocs. Uh, so if you or someone you know um, enjoys a fun and creative and productive work environment, um, get them in touch with me. Um, at my group's webpage, you'll find a link to the group's YouTube channel um, and to my Google Scholar profile and many other things. Uh, so now I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. How do we ask questions? I've got a question here from the lab. Was that John? Yeah, that was John, yeah. Please. Yeah, first of all, congratulations on this work. This is just absolutely terrific, you know, terrific stuff. My, my question is, you know, what I'm struck by is if you go back to the original image that you showed, the regular photographic image of that Marsh Plaza, whatever it was, you know, a million pixels, a million photons per pixel from a sort of, I don't know, information theory standpoint, that's way more than we need, right? And that million pic, that millionth photon gives you no extra information you didn't already have with the 999,999. So my question is based on your work, if you can get all this incredible results with just a one pixel or a handful of pixels, in theory, putting aside the physics of building the detector, could you get a picture like that one you opened with with one one thousandth as many photons if you had the detector? I mean, it seems like the information is there, right? Is or is that a naive way to look at it? Um, no, actually, I guess uh, so. So I so that that opening example, um, I tried to estimate the number of photons as well as I could, um, but I wasn't trying to show, let's say the best current low light photography that's out there, for example. Like, so there, there's been um, a lot of progress in low light photography with ordinary sensors. Um, and in fact, I think some of that work uh, has been productized by Google. Um, I know that um, Mark Lavoy and his collaborators have done uh, especially great work on low light photography. Um, so yeah, I think that that even in more conventional settings rather than this sort of 3D active setting, um, it's probably quite possible to be extremely more photon efficient. Um, it just probably has not been critical to applications except where uh, the frame rate is a primary concern. I don't know if that was a, a, a no, satisfying it's a great, answer no, it's, to it's, that. It's, no, it's a great answer. I just don't want to. I don't want to monopolize the question. <laughs> no, but I, I no, thank you. I'd love to talk about this for a half hour, but I'm I know better than to do that. So, oh, me too. Me too. I had a quick comment. I mean, I really liked your talk and. One, one thing I wanted to note was that there's, there's a, a similar phenomenon in seismology uh, that after a big earthquake or uh, when there's too much ground shaking, um, the seismometers typically shut off for, for a second or a fraction of a second. 
And then there's also this other thing that you can have like multiple earthquakes kind of happening at around the same time, earthquake and several aftershocks, and it's hard to decompose them. It, it just seems like there's a lot of similarity there to how they, uh, the kind of stuff that they have to go through to, to, to create an earthquake catalog. Hmm. Oh, well, th thanks for that observation. That's, that's an interesting idea. Um, for, I'll just, just throwing in some ideas uh, the the compensation or, or at least the, the accurate modeling of dead time effects. Um, one of the areas where we believe this can lead to good follow on work is in um, fluorescence lifetime estimation. Uh, other researchers who work in fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy or other kinds of fluorescence lifetime estimation, um, they have been concerned with um, compensating for dead time effects. Um, although, uh, as I was asserting here, um, one, of the, one of the popular methods for that, we found it to be a little bit flawed. Um, so I had mentioned in one of those four um, approaches that there's a method in the literature um, that we found was not quite right. And so our Optica paper demonstrates that we achieve improvements upon that. And, but we have not attempted yet to apply that to, to fluorescence lifetime estimation. But it's, it's very interesting to hear of other problems with similar dead time effects. Um, yeah, th thanks very much for that comment. So uh, Vivek, uh, thanks for this uh, great talk. Uh, you know, really enjoyed Hi, it. Hi, Achuta. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Um, so I guess you know one one question also is the insights that you're developing, right? Um, how do you see this? Uh, so far, you're using you know you're repurposing like a TCSPC and similar devices that are designed for different purposes. How do you see kind of longer term potentially redesigning the hardware systems uh, to account for these insights? Um. So I, I hope that there's a lot of impact in those directions. I mean, I'm, I, I, feel like, I feel like we're just scratching the surface in terms of um, exploiting accurate probabilistic modeling. Um, just to just kind of give an example, um, I feel like better crosstalk uh, modeling um, is going to be very fruitful. We've started doing that. Um, and I think that I think that accurate crosstalk modeling might lead to methods to you know, compensate for crosstalk that actually significantly change the um, hardware design trade-offs, right? Like that normally you avoidance of crosstalk is one of the reasons that uh, fill factors are limited. Um, but let's say that the probabilistic modeling and post-factor <laughs> sort of date, uh, compensation is very successful, then maybe you can design for allowing greater crosstalk, which would, uh, which would mean you know, designing for greater um, detection efficiency. Um, I mean that's that's one of my one of my favorite nascent areas of cross design, um, but I, I I think there there's other potential for um, you know, sort of processing and hardware co design. Yeah, thanks. Uh, really great talk. Thank you. Is that all the questions? Okay. Th thank you so much, Vivek. This was a really great talk. Um, Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Again, I uh, wish I could make, I wish this was a reason for a trip to LA, uh, but being there with you virtually is great. Um, well, do, do some more work and then you can visit us in person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Will do. I'll, I'll be looking forward to that next threshold to justify another invitation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor, I have a question. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, I'm happy to stay on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So for the first part, uh, uh, 
uh, I think your talk is, is very interesting overall. Uh, but for the first part, uh, when when I'm not very familiar with with how lidar works, so I'm just thinking um, if you if we shoot uh, lasers to an object, uh, it just seems to me that laser is is not a very big, it's just a beam, right? So then, how does how does that reflect? reflect? Uh, okay, so so I I I do realize that um, uh, you know I was intentionally trying to include a lot of things here, uh, and so some of the topics went by a little bit fast. So so the type of direct time of flight lidar that I was describing initially, that yes, there was a single laser beam and a single element detector. So I'm assuming that the laser source is raster scanned over the scene. Um, so yes, it's just like a narrow beam, but um, but it is scanned over the scene to oh. get the 2D transverse resolution. Was okay. that what you were getting at? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, right. I mean, just, it's just one beam. I'm not. I'm not I'm, 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 right, I'm, I'm, right, I'm, I'm, right. Yeah. So that that's just to get one of the points, and then that's raster scanned. There's oh. also um, so nowadays you can get arrays of single photon avalanche diodes. I think that a, uh, a Canon has announced a megapixel SPAD array. Um, the Optica paper that described that, I think is also co-authored by Eduardo Charbon and, and various academics. So they're, they're, so you can imagine that megapixel versions of SPAD arrays are, they have just come into existence and maybe they'll become much more common. Um, coming back to, to Achutha's point, I mean, so with the megapixel array, there are, um, there are there are limitations of that. That that megapixel array does not have um, fine scale time tagging for each of the million pixels. Um, they um, they the time tagging is on clusters of pixels. I think four by four. I mean, so there are various kinds of devices that can give you different combinations of spatial and temporal resolution and different numbers of elements. Um, and I was just sticking here with some of the high level conceptual um, aspects of, of getting very high photon efficiency. I see, I see, thank you. Uh, so for the scanning part, yeah. uh, can, can, the, can laser move fast enough so that there's not so much time lag between the, um, the, the places where it's scanned, because I'm thinking if we use that in like self-driving cars, then if the time lag is too big, there may be some issues. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right that the the scanning time is is important. Um, I'll I'll confess that I I'm I haven't been attempting to to keep up with exactly which solutions are the preferred solutions these days for automotive applications. But I think a lot of times there is a use of um, not, a, not a 2D array of sources, but maybe a 1D array of sources, like a line of sources that are scanned. Um, often there's also sometimes the use of a, a, a 1D array of detectors. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of system level questions in how to put these things together, but you're you're definitely right that you can't ignore the scanning time. I mean, there, there's a lot of trade-offs. Very interesting. Thanks. So uh, maybe like a philosophical question, it's a little different from your talk, but since you kind of just raised it, um, there's a, I don't have hands-on experience with this, so I'm also still trying to figure out the answer, but there's a lot of interest in uh, kind of silicon photonics for beam steering uh, and, and, and similar, right? Uh, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, Mike Watts, right, has started a company in Boston in your kind of neck of the woods uh, to kind of commercialize this uh, beam steering to overcome the low light problem. 
I know it's a little different from uh, from the focus of, of your work and, and definitely complementary, of course, but do you have any opinion on kind of the beam steering aspect that uh, we're seeing with silicon photonics? Um, not really. <laughs> I, 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 I wish I could I wish I could make an intelligent uh, comment on that, but but I haven't really followed. Um, I I'm again, I'm kind of willing to convert confess that um, I often uh, don't attempt to follow the um, the technology development in the sense of like which solution is winning over which other solution. Um, instead, I just uh, have fun with whatever set of concepts that I want to work with without without tracking these industries very well. Um, so that's not something I've tracked very well. I don't know how well that beam steering works relative to other possibilities. Um, I mean, I'm certainly happy to to hear more about it, but I don't think I can add uh, anything too intelligent on that. Okay, so any more questions? You know, I'll just say one other thing. If I, 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 I somehow messed up at the very beginning, I actually, for all the 290 students, um, I was going, I had a poll all set up so that today's grade would be based on whether you could properly guess um, how many photons were detected to form that photograph of Marsh Plaza. Um, but, I, but I gave away the answer before I could put up the Zoom poll. <laughs> they aren't getting graded anyway. But <laughs> fail, so. <laughs> okay. That's a good. That's a good idea, though. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can talk to more more of your speakers. Ask them. Gosh, make it more rough. Like at the forty minute point, please ask a question that is going to be graded. <laughs> <laughs> See if people are paying attention. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I'm I'm in, I, I I interrupted your your closing remarks. Um, sorry, that was terrible. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to speak here. This was a great and very interesting talk. Um, and I guess just thank the speaker. So. All right, thank you all. Thank you all for coming.